So welcome, everybody, to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Grady Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschker, and I'm the director of programs uh, and uh, executive director. And um, thank you for coming and taking time out of, of your life. And uh, today we are talking about what people would sometimes say the legendary squad theater and their work here in New York. And we have some of the members and the generations with us. So why don't you all come up here? The um, Siegel Center Bridges Academia and Professional Theater, American and International Theater. So of course the work of the um, Squad Theater fits uh, uh, like a glove uh, into it. And, um, and as we all know, Shakespeare's father was a glove maker. So this is a good theatrical um, uh, um, um, image. Um, we showed this afternoon their work. Um, and we will, of course, have a short introduction about the company. But in short, they worked in Hungary, in Budapest. They felt the only way they could show their work without making compromises was in their own apartment. Um, and they thought this would be the space of liberty and freedom. Of course, it already was a self-chosen exile in a way. But in one certain production, if I understand right, because of one song, it became very clear. It said, or you stop working in theaters, do you stop working performance forever or you have to leave the country and don't come back. So um, they chose to leave. It's uh, quite, uh, qu quite a story that they went from the, behind the Iron Curtain uh, through Rotterdam and came to New York. And so we're gonna work, talk about um, and their work and they are all um, here um, with us. They will introduce each other. Again, um, thank you for coming. If you have a cell phone, maybe just take it out for a moment and check that the sound is off. Also for, the, for you especially, the power has to be off. So let me see, I'll do the same. And um, there will be a short reception after all, uh, the, 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 uh, the discussions here in the room. And uh, we would like to welcome also some guests. I see Jay Sanders who organized the Great Whitney exhibition on the performing arts from the early 70s till the last years of the 70s and the 80s who uh, curated them and maybe you can also Join us a bit uh, for the discussion. We have the Jakob Ursus from the Penwell Voices Festival here, who is also happens to be Hungarian, is a great fan of the company. Antje Ögel and the great uh, from the theater agency, <clears throat> the great Judas Molina from the Living Theater is here with us uh, in France. So um, I think it's a, a, a quite a, a wonderful, uh, knowledgeable audience. Again, thank you all for coming. And um, this is Anna Coast, with whom I collaborated, and it all started with a discussion I had with Bonnie Maranka from the PHA magazine. Where's Bonnie? Here you go. She got out of a get a tea, um, and who said there was an upcoming article in her journal, and she said, and I said, I'd always uh, wanted to have this quad theater here. I have a great photo in my office, and this is how we contacted each other and collaborated. I actually was not, did not know about the great uh, Whitney exhibition and about all the work and work Eva did, and all of it. So um, this is um, how this all um, came about. And um, maybe we just go down the line and you say very shortly who you are and your name and how were you affiliated. And then maybe, Anna, you give a few words of introductions uh, of it. Yeah, Before but, everything, yes. I'd like to call everyone's attention that there are two people in the audience, as far as I can see, who were part of our show. One oh, yeah. is Larry Solomon uh, mm -hmm. doing camera for all three our productions and Clara Palotari, who acted, people who saw some of the organizers. My name is Anna Kosh. I was uh, part of this company. You were co founder? Yes. Can you, is your mic on? Can I see? I hope so. So, this is Bonnie Maranka from PJ yep. Journal, who we just missed <laughs> you talking about it, but um, yeah. So I'm Judy Galush Halas. I'm Anna's daughter and Peter Halas's daughter. I was one of the children in the squat theater. <laughs> if you want to get, yeah. Hi, I'm Eva Buchmuller. Can you say about your work also a bit what you did in the company? Um, I, I immigrated um, together with, uh, with uh, five adults, uh, Peter Berg, um, of Stefan Balint, Peter Hollas, Anna Kosh, Marianne Balint, 
and Esther as a child, and my two children, and Golush, a little three-year-old. We went to Paris first, and then we wound up here in the United States on 23rd Street. And um, I um, participated anyway, in any way I could. I was, I was Thank you. <laughs> um, you made great sets, and you did all the visuals. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, yeah, we all, we all had side jobs. I'm Esther Ballant, and I'm of the second generation of one thing in the world, and it's the Squat Theater. <laughs> um, and my father, Stefan Ballant, was one of the founders, uh, co-founders, and... Um, I'll take my own mic. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, Simon Dai, I'm Anna's son. Um, I grew up in the theater for part of my childhood. Uh, my father was in some of, the, some of the plays. I was born into the theater, um, partially raised in it. Um, and my, my role was to do whatever I think they told me to do in, in the plays, basically. Uh, I'm Rebecca Major, I'm Ava's daughter, and I emigrated to the United States for the theater um, as a five-year-old and grew up amongst uh, the theater and acted in various performances. So thank you um, for coming. Um, why we have the children here is not just, you know, because um, they um, followed or were part of the work. They were really an essential part of that company's work, what made them so unique, but we will come to say they performed with them, but they also lived together in in one building, in one house. Um, just to give a short description again, and uh, we talked about uh, this a bit earlier. So you were in Budapest, you performed uh, in apartments. We're gonna see some very rare clips today, which very, very few people have seen. But um, before we show them, tell us a bit, what was that situation like in, in when you performed in these apartments? Well, how did the world look like? First of all, um, at that time, in the, during the Cold War, uh, in the... Is Oscar your mic? Can I see if this is on? Can you... Can yes, it? it's on. The gentleman checked it. Yeah, he did? Yeah, it's on, right? It's on, yeah. So maybe a bit louder. Yeah. So, um, yeah. in an authoritative um, uh, political and social situation um, where, uh, where people couldn't really gather either for cultural reasons or for any other reasons, uh, they gathered in each other's apartments. This is even before we decided to continue working in the apartment. So um, there were uh, like Esther's uh, father and mother um, were actually part of a, a group of artists and a world that um, had this tradition going. So this is going back two generations or even three. Um, when after two years working in a uh, so-called culture house in Budapest, it was in the outskirts, um, each of our plays were banned. There were three or four, and the last one was so badly banned that uh, we couldn't perform in public. And we decided that we continue in um, either somebody else's apartment or ours eventually. Somebody else's, I mean, because they were, uh, in, among our audience, they were writers and um, prominent um, intellectual or cultural figures who were so kind as to invite us uh, to their apartment to create a, you know, a version of the play because obviously in an apartment you don't do the same thing as you do in a room like this or even bigger or which is public. Uh, this is how we began. Um, we did one in Ava and her then family's apartment. We did some in Stefan and uh, Marion's apartment. We did some in uh, Esther's grandfather's apartment. Could we maybe show two or three clips? Which I know we, we, we like, Which one do you think is one we could? Um, um, which is apartment? Uh, apartment, and which gives us an idea how that is uh, number four, five. Six, seven, eight, because these are only like 20 second pieces. Yeah, okay, so uh, maybe. But, but let me say something before that. Yeah. This, is, this hasn't come about because uh, we were so um, adamant on making films or being rich. What happened was that um, 
a friend, so quote unquote friend, um, wanted to make a film about one of the um, apartment uh, theater pieces, which was um, not a consecutive piece as here in New York we did. It was little scenes, one after another. It was always changing because we were looking for something. Um, what happened was that um, this fellow kept nagging us that one night after 2 a.m., let's make a film about it. Let, let me record it on 16 millimeter with lights. Now, this was, this was a little fishy and we didn't understand. We did it because we thought that's the only way to keep something on film and you will see it was the only way. However, later it turned out that this film was made because um, the uh, secret police wanted to see something. There were no videos yet and no little, you know, phones. And um, they did show all the footage to them. So here we go. We see something very unique. Here we go. The secret These police. are the uh, really young women of the audience. In uh, who were part, they came back at 2 a.m., you know, after a regular show to be part of this thing. This is 1973, because my daughter was three months old. They are, it's a fairly large room we had, um, and they were sitting um, on the floor by the wall or on, or around. And this came here because uh, um, the department has a, uh, an assistant, do I say it right? Attila Sabo. Attila, yeah. who works for the Hungarian Theater Institute. And it turns out, I didn't know that the Hungarian Theater Institute has this footage. Here he is. <laughs> This is one part. Yeah. Yes. I said they say even film the books, right? The, so this is. Unfortun and the next yeah, unfortunately, the film is not full. This is my sister. Um, Peter had a, a show with verdicts. He started vertically naked, no smoking, and he very slowly, imperceptibly dressed up. That was one of his, that was his puppet show. Peter, your husband. Um, yes. <laughs> there was a very short clip, and then we have. Yeah, because two more. we don't have more of this. Um, yeah. The camera, they, they didn't find it important to continue. <laughs> On the floor, Stefan Balin, around him, Peter Hollas, <laughs> and then you see the audience. Also, to think that this was so prov provocative. That they yeah, they thought this was, it was provocative. This was so banned, but whatever you saw that, this was unthinkable that anybody but, could watch that. You know, what was really bad was that the audience gathered, and among the audience were people who later became the so called democratic um, um, opposition. opposition, and they caused partially, of course, the change in 1989. Galus? There was a song, a humming, there is sound normally to it, but we don't have it here. You were there, you might be in there. So, did you see one of these shows? So maybe I'll give, yeah. Bonnie, I'll give you a short mic and maybe you just say it. I only have a few things to say, a few seconds. Um, I happened to be in Budapest in 1975 in August and um, I saw a secret performance. Um, it, I, I'm not sure of the, the exact circumstances of how I found out about it, but uh, through a sociologist I'd been put in touch with, um, he told us about these secret performances and took uh, me there and the person I was with. Um, and I recall being in an apartment and seeing Anna and Peter. And also the thing that struck me was after the performance, nobody clapped and everybody filed out of the apartment on um, a couple floors up in a courtyard and then filed out. Was that Peter's in your apartment? Yeah, yeah that was ours, yeah. Yeah, Not there was ours. a large crowd of people there and we were there about an hour, an hour and a half, but it was very silent and nobody um, made any noise going in or out
Do we have, do we have um, um, one more um, of the things you think? That could be, uh, yeah, sure, the um, um, six days in Shuran. Yeah, maybe. There are two, two little kids, first and second. Maybe you tell us a bit about it. Uh, we also um, worked in other uh, environments, for example, in an abandoned sand quarry. And because here again, what happened to us, uh, uh, after a couple of days, uh, we were, it was 1972, uh, the police came and showed up and sent us home. So some of, one of us decided, friend, that if this is a, a sand version of uh, Stefan Balin's uh, The Labyrinth, it was a play we did. Very, very early, very early beginning. So anyway, uh, somebody said, if we have a camera, then uh, probably they, and with a permit, they can't um, do anything. So we shot this film, which is, this is a moment of it. So one could say it's an early site-specific outdoor <laughs> you can say. theater without audience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is, mm, Minotaur, who is trying to get rid of all the possible theseuses. Uh -huh. <laughs> they are the Ariadnes. <laughs> This has always been silence, no, ever, any voice. It's wonderful, yeah. It reminds me a bit of, we showed once uh, the very early work of uh, Buto, of Kazuo Ono, who would do <laughs> performances going up the mountains and also very, very different, but very, very similar mm -hmm. to, to this work. That's another scene from the same. This is something that comes later, right? Yeah, yeah, well. uh, um, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. And um, I will come to all of you soon, especially, of course, also you, Eva, but um, before we show a clip from this truly legendary storefront um, 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 theater. Maybe you tell us a bit the story, um, how this happened. If I remember right, and I hope I don't mix it up, there was even CIA involvement. Is that, uh, is that true? And is that, tell us about the story, what happened. Uh, how did we get here? How you, your version, yeah. Yeah. In Paris, we um, were... Um... So you were invited to perform in Paris. Oh, no, no, we were... Oh, okay. You left, we left in you the couldn't, night. You couldn't emigrate from Hungary without having a country that, in, that in, um, accepted you. So, so one night in you, said, case, you said, we're going to leave tomorrow, we're going to pack our bag. You made that decision? No, no, what no, happened? It, take, it took three years. It took they you three refused years. us. Uh, first of all, the, the company uh, had... We, we, we left in two steps, in two ways. Eva, Stefan, and... Uh, um, Esther's mother, Marianne, they um, slowly but surely got their tourist passports. And with a tourist passport, you could leave, stay a little bit, and then you stay over, and then that's it. For that, they were uh, sentenced to, I don't know how many years of possible prison, yeah. something, yeah. Uh, the other half, uh, Peter Berg, uh, the curly-haired fellow, Peter Hollas and I, including Galush, we... Um, had to apply for emigration visa or emigration passport, which is nothing at the end we learned, a sheet of paper with photographs, and it says it's valid for going out, not valid to return. And um, that had to be organized because they don't give it to you just like that. And um, no, because your passport was withdrawn, you didn't have lots of food. Because my passport before. wasn't withdrawn. My passport I left in with King Kong. There's a mix up. Oh, it's true. Yeah, 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 she's right. Uh, at the ban, the ban said that 
we, the three of us in Galush, cannot travel for five years, cannot leave the country. So that's why we applied for an immigration visa. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. But the others who also left like that from like Sanchovi and others, they didn't, they weren't banned. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's why we did that. However, it took three years to get it, and um, uh, the country that accepted us was France, uh, thanks to um, uh, Andre Balint, Esther's grandfather, because he had uh, connections to the cultural attaché. And Jack Lang, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, he, no, no, Jack Lang was, came, came, came later. So if you want to know how we left Hungary, uh, we had to have a, a um, so the, the, French cultural attaché to Yugoslavia was an old friend of childhood friend of his who came to see a show in the apartment. And he said, yes, sure, their place is in the West. So he put his word into the proper places in uh, France, and we received a, a letter from France saying that we are accepted. That we, uh, long story short, uh, we left uh, in January 1976, Eva, Stefan and Marion, Esther and Rebecca and Boris, they left three weeks later to Paris to the same place. So we were there and there were a year and a half tough place, tough, tough times. And in these times, uh, we met somebody in Paris who worked for the, I believe, um, the brain drain or the CIA. Um, Dr. Faustus, who, uh, <laughs> who offered us, yeah, he came to see a show at the, it's at true, the Penish. Remember? I remember. But he had to work with them because otherwise there's no way that you can, you can arrange uh, immigration papers for somebody in, in Paris. And somebody mentioned it to me. But that's, the, the point is that he, uh, he even helped to uh, trans to convince the Ford Foundation to pay for the transportation of the Stavrogin puppet, if anybody saw Big Child Fire, the huge puppet that Eva made, um, because we said that we are a theater company and we need to have our props. So he said fine, and uh, they transported it. <laughs> and we were paid to come. So this sounds like the golden age uh, uh, that the yeah. American uh, government was trying to help a Hungarian underground company to come here as a brain drain and to create work in downtown New York. Um, that they didn't know. <laughs> that they didn't know, but uh, you know, you, for a while you were in Rotterdam and you created some work which you recreated, but maybe now let's look um, at one of the clips of this building. And I understand that through people who lived down the street, you were in, in the Chelsea Hotel? For a while, yes. For a while, yeah. and someone there, a mathematician or someone said to yeah, you? Yeah, 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 that's uh, a, few a few doors down the lane, there is a, down the street, there is a, the, he told Peter, there's a storefront because we were running around town to find storefront with a building above it where we could live, and so, that so was a perfect. Also the good old New Yorkers, there was an entire building with how many floors? Four. Four five, floors. Five, five altogether. And you rented five? it for five, for five years? Yes. That was the deal. So, um, so they lived in the building, worked in the building, and uh, maybe we can see, it will be a little bit flipped from five minutes or six, but not too long, from the very beginning. And, um, and if you go and see uh, Jay's show at the, at, at the Whitney, where he really documented a variety of the group of artists, some people say, well, but never more than 500, and they all knew each other. But uh, he recreated also this window, and uh, you will see um, their uh, photographs. But here is... Uh, 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 is it the very beginning of that? Yes, yes, Play. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. So you all feel free to, to chime in and explain what's going on. So what street was it again? West 23rd, 256. Right now, a uh, multiplex cinema. Behind is the 
Dostoevsky's um, The Possessed or The Devil, depending on which person. Usually the goat had a mask, <laughs> but now it didn't fit, so I don't know. It had a mask? Yeah, it had a mask, a baby, a golden ba uh, doll. A baby doll, yeah. yeah so when, when, the, when the goat did this, a uh, face mask. <laughs> you would see a baby mask, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Eva, you built the uh, puppet. Do you want to tell us a bit about it, maybe? Or? <laughs> It's Petio, uh, who is the honk in it. Um, there's an actor inside, right? Yeah, there's an actor inside, and, and it's his, uh, his, his portrait um, in his side. So it's a uh, it good, uh, comfortable fit into it. And then at the end of the show, this was this all. It was made of elastic. It was pulled yeah, off. The entire so, puppet yeah. comes down, and he's just hanging. Yeah, like a and lynch then man. you see that he's gone. So from what I understand that this is a later version of an earlier piece that was performed. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so it's a slightly reconfigured. Um, whereas Anna used to be on stage, I'm, I'm taking I'm the I'm over there. Yeah, you're on the side. And my character reads the confession of Strub Rogan, who, is, who seduces a young girl who I play, but in kind of a hindsight where I read the text. And then, um, but this was a part of a series of uh, a retrospective of the, of the plays, condensed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I believe it was the only um, video footage of yeah, 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 yeah. play, so this is the one that kind of remained, but the original version was Never a bit video. different in its formatting. Yeah, yeah. Because Galouche and Rebecca uh, alternatively lived there when they were much younger, children growing up in the world, and I was there on the active in the way. <laughs> So how so let us how long was a run of a show like this? How long did you play it? For how long? How many people fit in the room? I think seventy-five. So like here basically. Yeah. Yeah. It was small. It was bigger than this room? Uh, yeah. Longer. Oh, and deeper, so yeah. the... and risers that went up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long was the run? It yeah, depends. Then, we, we, we performed for two, three months with no audience, and then the audience started to come. Two, three months till people would show up. Yeah, but mainly because you had to have the New York Times or somebody to come down to write any bad or scandalous thing about you so that people come. Mm -hmm. And the audience was set up in such a way that if you wanted to leave, you'd almost have to go through the stage. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. If, <laughs> when an audience yeah. entered, they usually yeah. stayed. But, but even after we, we it, it, all three plays ran long run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is now also where then audience, passerbys, and actors on the street would mix, right? Yeah. 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 With a character there. Yeah. Like Peter. Here you can see the head of the actor sticking out on top. Hi, Nikolai Strobel, a retired army officer, lived in Petersburg in 1860-something. So uh, maybe uh, you'll stop here or you just take the sound away and we could uh, watch it. Maybe just take um, the sound away and, um, and I would now um, go and um, ask uh, some, um, some questions. And... Um, and uh, Esther Barland, who is here with us, who 
also performed in Stranger Than Paradise, um, a great uh, independent movie of this world. Um, so your experience with the Squad Theater, um, how, what, how did that help you or become a musician, an actor, or, um, or was that just a stage and you have left that behind? It's different? Hmm, I wouldn't say that exactly. Um, I don't know that it's the reason I've necessarily acted or done music, but I think it just influences everything I do creatively. It's pretty much inseparable, my experience and what I learned from the theater and um, sort of in my DNA at this point. <laughs> what are your memories, your childhood memories from growing up there and performing? Well, it's kind of my whole childhood. I mean, a certain part of it in Budapest and then eight or nine years on 23rd Street and then some other place, one squat split up, but we were still doing theater um, beyond that. So it's, it's not really... It, it would be hard to say what are my because it's it's sort of like a, you know what are your memories of growing up? It's my whole growing up was mm -hmm. was that was my family that was my life growing up. So it's sort of um, hard to separate. It wasn't separate from my growing up. So that play was reality and fiction or imagination well, and real was what was then part of your. Well, life. no, I mean I understood the difference between performing and real life, but. Um, the plays were, there was always kind of a state of emergency about the plays, <laughs> which is what I remember. Um, and uh, there was a lot at stake. Um, so I remember a lot of stress and a lot of joy, you know, mm -hmm. both sides of the coin. Yeah, I mean, because it was very, it's a very serious thing. In other words, it wasn't like, oh, we're living our life and we're just doing some theater on the side. It was, this is it, guys. It had, you know, some some urgency. Yeah, also a lot of urgency. five days, a, five days a week. That's a lot. And, then, and just that it meant a lot. It wasn't. It was, you know, emotionally a lot at stake. Like every, especially when there was a new play and it wasn't quite formed yet. It was. There was a lot of intensity to that process, and there's a lot of wonderful things about that that I learned, and I probably carry that around, good and bad, today. Yeah, I, just to give you an idea of how radical the ideas were, in one of the plays, the children would have a dinner, a real dinner, on because stage. on stage. They had a five-act play, but also the kids needed to eat. But so one scene, and I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to show later, but they were, were just... Eating, yeah, maybe uh, you can tell, tell a bit. Of... Can you take the mic? Okay. Yeah. yeah. It was a little bit also contrary to what was expected of us or yeah, what yeah, was yeah. allowed yeah. because this play was done in Rotterdam and um, we wanted first uh, black pigs and they said no pigs. <laughs> and then we wanted fire, no fire because the fire department won't let it. And then, okay, we want the children, on, our children in the play. No, no, the children. Uh, so no pigs, no, no children, so this no this is fire. how Pig Chat Fire came and just putting them on the stage, having dinner with their mother. I was the mother at that time. Was was kind of acceptable, you know. Mm -hmm. And there were six, seven, right? There's quite a number. No, uh, at uh, the original, there were only two kids two in kids. Rotterdam, you and Rebecca. And later, later when we played on 23rd Street, the sleepover kids came also. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all put in a show. I remember the hot chocolate was really good that Ava made for the dinner yeah. scene. I also just want to say that I remember, um, I think watching it, it's one of those things that's really impossible to, to catch on video because the whole idea of the dinner scene was that mm -hmm. that play in particular had a lot of theatrical mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. thing to it. And so it was sort of subversive in a way to just then suddenly have this very Sleep intimate, or... very okay. casual, very in your bedroom, which was almost brought from the apartment theater, I think, by yeah, yeah, yeah. a little exactly. bit. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, the, and there was a monitor 
which showed people on the street? No, people uh, Peter, in the audience. Oh, P oh, Peter was filming. Oh, the audience was looking at themselves, right? Yeah. Yeah. Happy, on, happy yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it, yeah, Squad was actually a very early video pioneer, use of video and live images, you know, on, on screen. But I think that, that uh, you know, this actually in a funny way leads back to your question before about how I was influenced. This is a really good example, that idea of just never getting that comfortable and always doing a little bit the unexpected aesthetic, I think, I hope, is somewhat in my aesthetic mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. things I do. Um, Eva, a question for you, uh, which I think is a big question about the, uh, the group setting or collective. How, how did you, what was the philosophy you think, what made the squad the squad? It was exile, actually. It was life or death, basically. Hence my point, a lot at stake. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. It was very, very serious. We, we left Hungary because we were banned from performing, and uh, we dropped ourselves, left everything back, back behind, and dropped ourselves into the unknown, and we had to um, prove that we had a reason to come. That's why. Mm, but uh, the idea, did, did you think it was a collective, that it was, uh, yes. everything was done? Uh, the idea was also there was no formal director or no formal leader? Or Tell us a bit about the idea. Yeah, it was, it was a democracy. I mean, I would say it was a terror of democracy. <laughs> the living theater would say anarchy, but you would say, right? You, but you would say it was democ democratic. Very model. democratic, yes. Uh, um, and therefore, it was kind of a, a terrorizing <laughs> idea that um, every, but basically, basically everything fell into place. Everybody functioned in their, in a way that they added to it. I remember Stefan was calling it um, a heap of hay. <laughs> or, how do you call it? Like something like a, you know, when they make in the street, in the, in the field, this haystack. haystack. <laughs> haystack. Mm -hmm. A haystack of anarchy, but it was not. It was, um, it was um, happily tell us functioning. Bit, let's say there's the, how, a new idea for a play. How did it? Was it created, and what, what was the process? Of, did you even do rehearsal, or what, what, how did you work? Um, sitting around at a table for hours and nights, and, uh, and throwing in ideas and, and having those ideas rejected. And, um, there was a lot of yelling, a lot of yeah. cursing, yeah. a lot of hair twisting, and a lot of smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So and for two, three months, you would discuss an idea? Or longer. Or even longer, half or a year. Or shorter, whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah and uh, sometimes it was uh, taken at the easiest way to start. For instance, um, the idea was there that to make a film f for most of the plays after, um, to, to, uh, to kind of um, have a fuller experience of theater. And um, doing a film usually took months and very, very long time because um, there were parts, it was in parts and then, then it was edited and while this process was going, the play itself was also brewing and, uh, and written down most, most, most of the time by Stefan Balint who, who, who was a poet and a writer and he um, for, finalized the ideas in text. So basically, this is how it was. So um, maybe also a question for uh, for Simon, who you're now in a Brooklyn family court, were you? Uh, um, yeah, I'm uh, actually. In the can church. you take uh, the mic? Uh, sure. Sorry. I so so you were one of them who you didn't went into theater or film or music. You you chose this. What did it have, what impact did this experience have on you? Um, well, I, in, I did some th uh, theater and, and film afterwards, um, but not for very much longer, that's for sure. And certainly I didn't choose that as a career, um, not that I necessarily had an option. But I ended up becoming an attorney, and I think what, what's interesting is uh, after spending my childhood growing up in squat theater um, on 23rd Street uh, with all these families mixed together, I ended up um, basically 
serving as an attorney for children in family court in Brooklyn, um, kind of playing a significant role in how these families um, end up organizing their lives and, and their families um, for, for a, a significant amount of time. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, my experience is rather unusual for, I, I think, the vast majority of um, Kings County families, and I certainly don't tell them about it. Um, but what it's, what's, what I think the impact is, it has had is that it has allowed me to, uh, I think, be more um, forgiving, be more patient. It's made me, I think, more liberal in terms of um, the way I view how other families decide to conduct themselves. I don't have these kind of um, reactions to, to how, um, to things that happen in other people's families. I, I, I don't tend to judge too harshly. The other thing that's interesting is that my I, growing up with so many adults in my household um, as as a child, I I kind of look favorably upon the idea that um, multiple adults should be involved in children's lives, that children should be exposed to um, a variety of adults, grandparents, um, and the like. There's a tendency in family court or in litigation in general, but in family court to kind of hog the child for the each litigant self. Um, and kind of view the child as a, a possession for the two parents to sort of divide when in reality the child might have other ideas um, and the, the best outcome might be for the child to really end up spending a lot of time with a variety of adults in the community. So I, th that's the one thing I, I kind of thought when I thought about this a little bit ahead of time and um, that's I, I would say the, the most clearest impact that it's had on me professionally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's <laughs> true. It's like it takes a, a village, uh, as uh, Hillary wrote on. But maybe um, also you, uh, um, Rebecca, what you continued as an artist. Yeah, I'm currently in an MFA program at Hunter. I'm in the M MF, the, yeah, I'm a combined media student, so I do a range of um, projects from video, um, a lot of it theatrical in that it's costume based and character based but I also do drawings and sculpture and I think that my influences are varied. Um, my father Janos Major is an artist and he remained in Hungary. I had very limited access to him during my childhood but I've now realized as an adult that my, my art is very influenced by his work. But that's not to say that I'm not influenced by the Squat Theater, which it's, it's impossible not to have that um, behind me as an influence. And it does show up my, in my work. And I think that is why my work is so varied in its expressions. But um, the one thing that I think both my father and the Squat Theater share as a continuum, which is just accidental, but is this um, how the, the body and the, uh, is, is related to society. And I think that the Squad Theater works do incorporate a lot of that um, interaction with the world and, um, and, and that influence and that strange place between um, reality and, and make-believe. And um, so I, I think that's, that's what I got from that experience. Mm -hmm. But I think I just wanted to comment on, on Esther's, um, because Esther is five years older, and she was kind of... She was a child, about 14 or so, but she was really incorporated into the, um, the machinations of the directing and, and writing part, um, whereas the younger generation, a bit younger than herself, was not. And um, I think that's an interesting experience as a child to have had. And I think that also kind of goes back to the democratic quality where they, you know, her age didn't really... Um, <laughs> keep her from having a say in how she felt about it. It's more about the, uh, more the personality or the intensity. Like if she had an opinion, it counted somehow. Um, and uh, yeah. Can I just add to that right briefly? Cause it's interesting. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've tried to encourage with my, I represent just children in family court is I try to, I, you have to um, keep certain some information and be careful about how you say some things to children. On the other hand, I certainly don't try to dumb down to them very much, and I really try to talk to them kind of straight. And I think um, that is definitely rooted in, in my experience. I don't, and I think Rebecca was just kind of hitting, touching upon it. 
Um, I think we all had the experience from our um, parents and the adults that we kind of talk, talk, talk to pretty straight. Um, you know, I, I think for the most part, we weren't dumbed down to at all. And, you know, we were talked to pretty, uh, you know, they, mm. they, they gave us a lot of credit, I think. But I think that, like the theater, it does require a lot of intensity and a lot of sacrifice. And I think we all sacrifice in, in, in very mm. deep ways. Yeah. I and my sister, you know, having to let go of a, a family in another country and we start. And I think the theater did you know, require that on an ongoing basis, like a, a recommitment real, on it. A real, real commitment. Before we show a second a clip from the Andy Warhol's Last Love, maybe, um, Judas, you are a tenured professor at SUNY, plus you're a sociologist, you are writing about the bohemian scene uh, in downtown New York. Obviously, this also um, had a direct um, impact on you. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I did my dissertation on the downtown creative and bohemian scene in New York. And part of that came out of, you know, wanting to understand how it is that things like the squat came about, why people would make the choices that they did, why my parents made the choices that they did, which, and as Rebecca says, involved some great sacrifice, um, but also entailed a tremendous amount of freedom and independence and an entirely different way of living than what I had seen among my friends. And so, I wanted to make sense of this. It was, a, it was still puzzling, even though I grew up in it and it was my world, you know, a world I had entirely taken for granted. I never really questioned it as a kid. Um, but later as an adult, it, it became clear to me that these were serious choices. Um, so in the, the work that I've done, I've tried to look at artists' lives and bohemians' lives, people who do creative work, and see what the conditions are that allow for that. And I think growing up in the squad has given me a lot of insight into it because certainly that we had the space, that we had the time, that we had a lot of people who were also um, engaging in some kind of creative activity, not necessarily in the theater, not necessarily doing, you know, collaborating, but people who were around, a lot of people were drawn to the squat and it did become, like you described the apartment theater, it became a meeting point. And as a kid, I mean, I remember, I think it was my sixth birthday was like a, a who's who of the you know, New York crazy artists, you know, graffiti artists, no wave musicians, I mean, videographers, you name it. And these people were all hanging out, probably pissed drunk. And there I was, happy as a kid, happy as could be, because it was a big party. So it was that kind of scene where a lot of people came mm -hmm. together. Um, and that kind of energy, right, I think enabled the kind of creative work that the squat did and a lot of other groups did, which is something that certainly in my, you know, in my research, and I don't think it takes much to, for anyone to see this, is largely fading in New York because it's expensive. Space is expensive. It comes at a premium. People don't have the free time that they once had. And so those were the, you know, some of the things that became very clear to me um, that were critical to the squad to be able to exist, to do what we did. But the extraordinary uh, living together as a collective, a way for theater artists to combine a family life, a life with children, and their art, um, with you know, um, and it in a way, at least did work. It's uh, extraordinary. That's why we all saw this is good to have you all with us here. But let's go back to the art and to the work of theater. We're going to look at Andy Warhol's um, last life. We're going to see some of the film clips which were part of their work. And maybe you or whoever wants to comment on it, you say something. And then Brad, uh, if it's possible, maybe after this, we're going to go back to the very first scene of the opening, but right now let's see uh, Andy Warhol's Last Love and maybe someone of you, or uh, say, tell, us about the pl tell us about the work. Let's see what's coming up. <laughs> yeah, but it will take. Uh... Yeah, this is the film, uh, part two of Andy Warhol's Last Love uh, on Kafka's uh, parable and you carried on message. So it was on, on Kafka. Yeah. The serial message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, Andy Warhol is the eternal messenger, right? Who never gets to it. But it's all our fantasy. It's <laughs> you are. Uh, and this was projected in this theater on the screen, so the storefront yeah. curtain was, like a Brechtian curtain was closed, and you saw a projection. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. At the Whitney now, that's uh, 
the um, yeah. And the film is going on non-stop. And there were no actors, it was just then film, what you, the audience watched. You were not exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. Just like here, far. <laughs> And the, the characters uh, are known for the audience because they appeared before uh, on the second floor as aliens or as part of Tell the us group. about, it was on different floors, right? Tell us about yes. the setup of the play. In the the part one takes place on the second floor, called Aliens on the second floor. Uh, and... Um, Which had been Ava's bedroom. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ava and Stefan's bedroom. And uh, Ava receives uh, at night uh, on a CB radio a message from space that Larry Solomon created and Esther uh, spoke and Stefan wrote, um, Earth, Earth, come in Earth, <laughs> about how to die in public. So the entire audience, 70 people went to the third, second floor. Yeah, I don't know whether there were seven people in the room. Yeah. And there were risers in that room too. Just a little riser. Yeah. And then uh, at the end of the, the scene, um, an alien, um, until I was pregnant, was me, um, broke the only light bulb that was in the room. So obviously, it was smoke and um, darkness, so everybody left. Music was calling the people out. They went downstairs and saw this film. And at the end of the film, and it all enters the company of the music. And as you can see, this is very elaborate uh, film work uh, for a theater company that was producing basically out of their home compared to the time where we live now, where everything is media, intermedia, multimedia. This looks uh, uh, so well done and, um, and uh, uh, such high. High quality. Maybe, Brad, if you could go back to the beginning um, of, uh, of the scene when they all um, are sitting at the uh, table and, uh, yeah. Like this. Eva, maybe you tell us a bit more. Yeah. It's Ulrika Mano, Esther's voice, this yeah. falling earth. It will appear very soon. And um, she. she if this means that the message is coming now and they should all come in to listen and then all of us listen to it and it gives instructions. This is on the second floor. Now. Yes. yes. Yeah. The building was a gay club before we moved in and, and the, the rooms had different functions. And this room had the risers on either side. So it was a natural seat for audience and for performing audience also. So how did the rehearsal, for example, for this scene now, how was it that way? How did, who decided about costume, words, movements? How did that work? It was um, Andy Warhol and Ulrika Meinhoff's um, meeting, which was uh, pretty much us. Um, we came from Europe, meeting America, and uh, Ulrika Meinhoff was... Um, the German terrorist from the, you know, Israeli... Yeah. yeah. The, this yeah, is Ulrika Meinhoff speaking to the inhabitants of Earth. And she just died you must at that make time. Your dad public. And uh, it was big news. Uh, was yeah, I just wanted to, because you asked how, how did the movements, the gestures, were you asking? Yes. And I think I was very young, obviously, as you can hear. So you're speaking um, now in yeah. the voice of Erika Meinhoff um, to the Earthlings. Um, oh, I think that some of the gestures, and everybody had a certain shorthand already from the Budapest Department Theater, which was very apparent to me watching this scene. Tell us about the shorthand, what do you mean? At a certain per pers persona, presence, identity, and so I don't think these gestures were ever choreographed per se, but I think this, this essence of just being very real, very intimate, 
bury yourself, and, but at the same time larger than life, bringing your presence onto the stage, but in this, a lot of juxtapositions in this bedroom, you know? So I think that this, this was already kind of so part of the aesthetics the way of the theater, what you see here. It wasn't something that they needed to choreograph, per se. I, 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 I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. So it means actors, the way they acted for different productions, they would have a style like a musician the, who plays bass or guitar. Very, very good analogy. I think there was already a, a kind of coded language that could be referenced. Yeah. So this was then the message out of space for New York. But you, Anna. What I wanted to say was that... A little bit louder. Can you speak a bit louder? This, uh, this scene has a predecessor. The very this first is the uh, only way apartment play you that Spielberg, Petra, he, this fellow with the butterfly, created uh, with his girlfriend, from uh, with the table, and, um, creating two scenes, one under the table and one above the table, for hours. And many Must actions that happen in this scene the were worked out there. The and this evolves all the time. Yeah. You know, later Publicized it came about in another form, in another situation. And for Andy Warhol's Last Love, in, radio, uh, in, in the, the first scene, we used that we basic setup and basic and uh, flyers. So there was nothing to rehearse because we knew it already. So yeah, the, so there was already like a... a yeah, yeah. The so the DNA from Budapest came, it was just growing out. Yes, and then, it, and then it, of course... So you never rehearsed that lot. thing, you just went in there and that's what you did? Well, I think there was a lot of discussion and there were, there were rehearsals, but there were no rehearsals, okay. Can you take the mic and tell us? So this was a theater, you performed for two or three months, you discussed for three months, but there were no rehearsals, is that... Right, exactly. It was it was told that you do this and and then you follow up with, with something else and and afterwards there was always a huge big criticism, sometimes shouting you fucked up, and, but there was nothing really rehearsed. But then again, I just want to point out there's a lot of um, techniques. I mean, technical things that are happening. So Anna's crushing of the light bulb has to be done in a specific way at a very specific time. No, um, Petya sets the the tablecloth on fire. Sometimes that That's worked right. out. Sometimes that didn't work out. So these technical issues were almost highly precedented. I would, say. Yeah, it would take precedent because they had to happen at very specific moments. Yes, that's very true, and, and it should be pointed out that this, this natural reference book of gestures was juxtaposed against a very highly choreographed, precise, technical series so you, of actions. Every show would be almost by the second, in the evening later, but would be not necessarily because but no, more or less, yeah, yeah. And we, but not improvisation, no. no. Well, but there was some, um, yeah. in the sense that you were given direction, you were given a series of things to do. Even as kids, we were told you do X, Y, and Z, but you accomplish it however you did on stage as you're, essentially as you. I mean, especially for us kids, there was a lot of that, be here, do these things. Whether it's a dinner scene, you're going to go out on stage, you're going to eat dinner when it's done, you eat. Um, or in Chekhov's Three Sisters, for example, I was told, you sit at the edge of the stage, draw, have fun, and then at the end when you're called, you go up on stage, join the Three Sisters, they'll give you some tea, they might offer you some vodka, enjoy yourself, and this is it. So it was just being there, but following certain steps, not so much how to act, but what basic things to accomplish. Was highly choreographed. Just, just yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it looks. It, it seems yeah. like it very clear and precise. <laughs> but it self organizes, you know. <laughs> self organized. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, we do. Um, since you mentioned the three sisters, unfortunately, as far as I know, there's it's never been taped. It's never been. Unfortunately, some people say it is the most <laughs> sublime version of a three sister they have seen, uh, uh, or the most I interesting one, the most conceptually challenging one. Can you tell us a bit about this, so, whoever? Um, I'll say a little bit, even though yeah. I was probably the least aware of what was going on on some level. Um, it was three men playing the three sisters. So Peter, my father, Pishti, and Petra would, in white suits, very formal, big beards usually, um, play the three sisters on a small stage with you know this very refined tea set and vodka. And they would 
sit there. Anna would be in a prompter's box at the front of the stage. You couldn't really, the audience couldn't see her, and she would prompt the dialogue. She would just tell them the lines. You, you would hear the dialogue. You, you would, would hear, hear your the, prompting. Yeah, you would hear her prompting. I was off to the side. I could hear her prompting. Here you can hear the prompting. This is Peter Donat's film, a friend of ours who was an artist. And uh, I haven't seen it uh, until uh, a year ago when somebody in Budapest uh, screened it. Um, he... Uh, I hope that the sound will come up. Yeah, he uses, it's, it, yes. it, it's the very last time, the summer, late summer or September before we left. Hungary. Yeah, 75. So there's no sound, I guess. Yeah, but, but there is sound. The sound is my prompting the three sisters because he was this so is touched. the three sisters. No, 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 no. It's not. It's just uh, this is a visual improvisation to the soundtrack. To the soundtrack. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, but let's go back. So, the three men played the three sisters. Every other role was stripped away. A prompter yes. gave every line, and, and then it was repeated in a very man. flat, technical, yes. Christian manner. Yes. And that space that was created there brought up many emotions and many thoughts and many. What, what theater is, basically. Has someone seen it in the audience? So maybe, I don't know, do you want to say something? But, uh, one second, one second, could you speak on it? Sure, sure. Um, I happened to see that performance, and uh, it was really, really thrilling. And I, I would say it was sublime. The, the, the three guys were there. They really took their time. They, yes. were, they were smoking these cigars and uh, eating some fruit. And it was very calm, and the prompter would say the line, and they didn't say it immediately either. They would take it in, just like we took in the line, mm -hmm. and then they would repeat it, and not necessarily giving it such a you know a character spin or something like that. It was as if it was as if some something had come to them in a dream, and then they thought to repeat it mm -hmm. for everyone to hear. And the performance that I happened to be at. Uh, Richard Schechner happens to be in the audience, too. And somehow, between the two of us, we started repeating the lines as well. <laughs> and I, I don't know if you remember that performance, but at, uh, for a lot of that performance, and other people joined in, and the audience started speaking the, whole, the text with, with the actors. And they took, they took that all in. That was OK, you know. So that's my recollection of it. I really enjoyed that performance. Yes. I thought it was Maybe yeah. Bonnie, if you... Uh... Okay. Um, my, my recollection is that it was very um, flat, I mean, uninflected uh, acting, um, very elegant, and um, very um, stylized. And it reminded me of, say, doing Chekhov in the style of Marguerite Duras's India song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so it was the art, there was a European art film sensibility that Squat brought to that play, which was always done, Chekhov, Chekhov has always been done in a very sentimental way in the United States. There have been very few productions around that, um, especially in New York, the ones I've seen, that have not been uh, overly sentimental. Um, and also, if I recall, it was on a very small platform, um, not a high platform, just a raised um, uh, area, but it was very small. But, the, but what stands out is the stylized, languid, white sense and a particular kind of light, but that it was very filmic. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, the Marguerite Duras style of India song. Yeah. Tom, uh, is it possible to ask Judith, did she see the squad, Judith Molina from the Living, did she see the squad theater? And uh, if so, what, what do you? Uh, uh, yes, on 23rd Street, in the store window, I've uh, attended and it's been very important part of my life and my reality and my theater work. And I want to say, I wish you could get together and keep it going. <laughs> the one thing I wish is that it didn't have to stop. And I'm not sure that if any two of you are in a room at the same time, it has to stop. You can go right ahead. <laughs> I think you're wonderful. Thank you for saying that so much. Thank you. Before, maybe since we already started, we can't go to audience questions right away. But my last question would be, 
about the New York scene, um, the graffiti artists, the musicians. Um, was the squad a magnet? Who were, who were one of those named artists who came, uh, uh, came to uh, Paul no, Tech? Guys. Or I don't know, like artists who later became well-known, more well-known? Or could you give us a name about the scene of the squad leader? Who came? So probably the most well-known person who would become the most well-known was Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, he was, you know, he was certainly there. And then, but then there were a lot of musicians, um, videographers who were also there who maybe didn't develop the same notoriety. So for example, um, Rebecca's closest friend's father, Michelle O'Dare, who was married to Viva, one of Andy Warhol's um, former actresses, superstars, they were certainly there quite a bit. Um, there were other rap musicians and graffiti artists like Ram LZ and Toxic and A1 and then musicians like DNA, No Wave musicians. Um, Sun Ra. Sun Ra came and performed there, which was probably my favorite performance ever. Fuss and Fassbinder filmed your plays. Fassbinder, I was going to say, yeah, filmed three of the plays. In, in, what did he uh, say Cologne. about What did he say about the work? Did you well, have... I just um, remember being really excited because we were going to premiere Mr. Dan and Mrs. Free in Cologne, and he, uh, we arrived. And uh, there was some article in the local cultural magazine about this, the Théâtre de Velt, the theater festival, and he had written, and they, he was being interviewed for it because he was going to do some filming around the festival, um, documenting it. And, and he actually had said in that interview, I remember crystal clear that the theater he was most excited about was us. And I was like, wow, you know? And he came and filmed all the, all the, Plays and as well, uh, no small potatoes. Susan Sontag came a number of times to the 23rd Street. Um, so those are just some other people I wanted to mention. Mm -hmm. Since Can we're I, dropping names, yeah. I think that we could ask Clara Polotoy, who is yeah. here. She knows a lot about all those people who came, mm -hmm. and she can give us a little background. And I blog that everybody, but Shirley Clark uh, was very yeah. important, uh, who lived uh, in the Chelsea Hotel, and uh, we really admired her work, and she ended up uh, playing in one of our films, and first we asked uh, uh, to play the wife of Robert Frank, who was also a close friend, and uh, for some reason, he didn't want to do it because they, they, they said it brings uh, back some memories. So we asked uh, Ricky Laycock uh, to play the husband. So it was kind of a strange pairing of people. Yeah, amazing. Also, Nico lived, at, lived really? with us for, I think, at least a year, maybe longer. Mm. So before we now open it up, I just would like to ask Jay, and I hope I don't put you on the spot, uh, if you, Jimmy. Jay, you uh, worked for a very long time on the exhibition, you know, on these kind of uh, performance art in lofts in unusual places, covering um, 71 till 80 or 70 to 80. Um, and you gave uh, significant space also in your uh, exhibition. Can you tell us a bit about your journey to get it together? And where do you see the squad fitting in, what did impact? Yeah, um, yeah, and that was a lot of discussion with Eva because we met you know, a year ago maybe and had kind of countless conversations how to present the work in the Whitney. Um, and I thought, I mean, with that exhibition, but especially with squad, it was all these great singularities kind of in that era. So, I mean, I could, you know, maybe I was relating them a little like, like people a little bit earlier, Richard Foreman or Jack Smith, people that made theater in their own domestic space and kind of merged art life. But I think the, the terms of it were really different for squat because of their situation. And coming later, the work sort of addresses popular culture and media and art and the city in a really different way. And so, you know, it's, it, and I, it came to me kind of as this infamous venue also. Like I'd heard of squat theater through the no wave scene and as this place where a lot of other artists performed or there's Sun Ra records from there or something. So you know it as a venue, but also as this theater company. Um, but I think just the kind of sophisticated use of media space and urban space and domestic space is totally unique. You know, so when I, 
you know, I had only known a little about it, and I didn't, I wasn't here in the mid '90s when Artist Space did a retrospective of Squat. So I really came to it in the last, you know, year or two, especially since meeting Ava and sort of working on it. But um, and I would ask you, it's something that we never really talked about. It's like how you approached making the exhibition. Like, it's a fun, you know, the room is really immersive, but in a way, it's a kind of hall of mirrors in there. There's not a lot of, there's not really much in there in a weird way. It's you know, video and these prints and this and the simulation of the storefront, but I'm curious, like, you know, because it was really your vision in a lot of way, like how that came together. But I'd love to hear your thinking about it as you, you know, you approached it. Um, I got great help from Oxvaldo, yeah. my friend who is an architect, and I was uh, working uh, like crazy trying to finish jobs over the summer and doing decorative painting, and uh, he started ahead of me and he came up with most of the great ideas. Why don't I just give it to him? <laughs> totally unprepared, but <laughs> um, the space is what's, we talked a lot about it and, and we actually argued a lot. That's how we usually do things. Um, so it went through a lot of permutations, <laughs> but the space is essentially, uh, believe it or not, the a lot of the the um, the information came from or from Saint from San Carlino La Quattro Fontana by Borromini in Rome, and the space is really like a church. With the each wall has a uh, an image that moves, and the frieze. So that's what it's about. No, and it's very subtle because like Eva also does. Um, decorative painting and can do almost anything to a wall or, you know, you do, the, you, know, you do this as your work, but you did this very subtle painting. I think you did a lot of very subtle things about the lighting and the tuning of that room that I think wouldn't be typical, you right. know, museum. It's, it's basically a ghost room because I, there are no more props. I, I, I got rid of everything after art space and I can't, couldn't store it and it aged, didn't age very well and so forth. So it's, it's only images. And the sort of great help was that, that he said, you guys have such strong images. So basically it's, it's image over image over image, <clears throat> different, different scales and different, different mediums. Uh, so there is, all, all the walls have something to, 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 to show and to move and <laughs> mm. <laughs> to message. And yeah, so, so I forth. hope you all will have a chance. I mean, it's there for a while, uh, till March, I forget, February. So you have to see it. But now let's take some questions. Number one, uh, who else? Uh, another one? Okay, so we start with you. Hold close. I, I actually have maybe three quick questions and you can answer any one of them if you can. First, um, when I, what I remember about having seen Mr. Dead and, Mr. F and Mrs. Free is probably what a lot of people recall is that big giant baby. I, I'm very interested to know how how that was made, how that was fabricated, um, and what it was made of. And then my other main memory is of a military jeep pulling up over the sidewalk and driving onto and loading up um, a body on a stretcher onto the jeep. Can I assume that you didn't get any like permits to be able to drive that jeep up on the sidewalk? Yes, and did. assuming that, how did the person driving the Jeep know when to drive it up? Because they weren't in the theater to know that, and you probably didn't have cell phones to call the person and say, okay, drive the Jeep now. And then my last question is, um, I would assume that ticket prices did not pay for the rent for the entire building. If you did pay the rent on the building, how did you pay it? We <laughs> didn't. As somebody who has a 40-hour-a-week job and tries to make yeah, theater. We didn't. Next the microphone, please. The baby was made of, of, um, of wood, um, chicken wire, and actually newspapers I found in the street <laughs> well, with, um, with um, homemade um, wheat paste. That's it. And it was based on wheat paste. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it actually was based, the idea came from the first test tube baby who was just born at that time. Her name was Elizabeth. I don't know her last name. She must be some 30 years old or something more. <laughs> but <the laughs> but uh, and actually, yes, and Cora was also born to the, to yeah. the, to mm -hmm. the, to the, into the theater, Peter and, uh, and Agnes's daughter, who is 
-hmm. not here right now. Anyway, uh, so she was also a model for the baby, but it, the idea was to be an, to have this artificial baby with a with monitor eyes. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of children in many ways. Uh, about the jeep. Do you want to say? It was very simple. I mean, you see, when there are no people, you drive up. Just anywhere in the place? No, it was, it was timed. How was it timed? Well, they knew how long it takes to go around the block. Yeah. Okay, so the, one of the best moments that I love in this play, when there is no Jeep, no nothing, and all of a sudden the Jeep passes by and doesn't even come in. <laughs> but everybody recognized it, the audience went, oh. <laughs> Well, it was, yeah, very simple calculation, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we did have, we had to have a permit because we had many trouble, we had a lot of trouble with the police, so. Yeah. They, they were did, shooting people outside yeah, yeah. with they, guns. They give film and, permits, you know, as if we, the, we had uh, been filming. That's the raw version. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe just in case, Brett, you find it in the play, on the DVD, and you can show us without sound in the background, that would be great. What was the other question? The, 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 the rent. economic model of the... Yeah. Uh, Collaborative of the collective. It wasn't. A, don't it try it. I don't paid. recommend it. Yeah. Oh, the rent. Rent. So yeah. how did it happen? Painful model. We didn't pay the rent for months, sometimes <laughs> years, <laughs> years, and you know, constantly battling eviction. I would hear stories of Anna and my father going to the landlord, begging them not to evict us, and somehow, through you know, God knows what kind of negotiations, would get a reprieve until uh, 1985 when they decided that they wanted to. Um, repurpose the, the land and rebuild and build on it. So they demolished the building, built a huge multiplex. You can see movies in our bedrooms and in our old theater um, because the building no longer stands. But that was it, I think. But how much was the rent, let's say, for a month? It was very simple. One, it started with 1,000 a month. And the entire building was $1,000. Yeah. yeah. What, what about <laughs> the heating bill? The heating? What? <laughs> at the end, at the end. It I remember wrong. kerosene heaters and all over the building. Yeah. <laughs> I, remember, I remember heating up uh, Eva, water to take more. Heating baths. what? Sorry? Heating up water. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was no heat for a while. Peter Hollas came with me to the landlord, and he beat the table that you goddamn capitalists, you don't give heat to the kids, to children. Well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, after that, oh, he said, I'm not going to talk to you. So I was the one who sometimes took $500, $400 to the office because uh, he wouldn't talk to anybody else anymore. <laughs> so how, so the ticket price, oh, I don't need what was the ticket price? The ticket price, $4. At, in the beginning, and we went up to 10 Mr. and Mrs. Free was 10 sorry. And Sandra was even more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> because so we had started to... with four or five yeah, yeah, and yeah. went up to the incredible amount of 10 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And when we moved out, oh, we owed $99,000. And he wrote print. it off. $99,000. But he augmented it with some sort of water charges, you know. <laughs> it wasn't fully rent. <laughs> Incredible. So one question here. Hi. Um, I'm curious if you could just speak a little bit more to the creative process around the table. I know it was a lot of arguing, <laughs> and I know it was um, a lot of battles, but was it, would somebody walk in and say, I read this great article, what do you think about this? Or would somebody say, I've got this idea, just an image I dreamed of, or some weird moment that came to me, and then the other people would say, that's stupid, or would then the next person say, actually, it's really interesting, Let's think about that. Or how did the actual process, I know it's hard to explain something that went over years, but I'm wondering if you could give a little bit more into that. As so you're just, uh, in the background, you see the big baby and the soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. It's robot. without sound, so let's keep it rolling so um, we can see it. That sounds pretty close, at least yeah, yeah, in yeah. the ballpark, yeah. I would yeah. say. Um, there was definitely sometimes things in the news. Uh, I think, you know, just, yeah, ideas, and like I said, there was a little bit of a reference encyclopedia from just the group having been together for such a long time, so I don't remember that much. Do you guys? Yes, that? I do. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I do. But maybe, yeah. Just, yeah. You know, people, uh, we, we were not only um, uh, 
quote unquote brainstorming around the big table. That was very much part of it. But like Eva and I talk in the kitchen, or Eva and Stefan talk whenever they go for a walk, or many many combinations, you know. By the way, Larry Solomon can give you some idea because he witnessed, he sat there uh, with an English ear and we were talking Hungarian among each other. So, so did you witness, I mean, maybe give it to you, uh, the, the creative process, if you can give us a little bit of comment of, well, uh, if you have a memory. For, for better or worse. He's a filmmaker, um, yeah. I was in on, on all of these things, but it was always in Hungarian. It was <laughs> in Hungarian. I did not speak. Yeah. And um, it would be, uh, there, there would be a little, uh, you know, we, I desperately want to get involved. My friend Kathy wants to get involved, Kathleen the Witch. And um, we just kind of sat back and took, took it all in. And, and, and so far as rehearsals, I remember the very first time. Um, well, I won't go into that story of how I got there, but I showed up to do some videos before. I'm trying to remember the venues because it was before. It was on, on a silver Street. bookstore on West Broadway. We were yeah. looking for somebody who could f film the outside scene for picture fire and who could also have a camera because you see to rent a camera and have a person that didn't match, but you had it both. And everybody was sitting on the floor and um, I said, okay, what do I do? Because at that point I'd come into video and film. You know, I was trained, I studied it in college and I was doing it professionally and I knew all about storyboards and scripting and this just blew, blew all the rules away. I said, well, okay, I'm here with all my equipment. I said, what am I supposed to do? I don't know. He said, just do what, do what feels right. I said, oh, okay, <laughs> it works for me. But uh, yeah, lots and lots of talk and um, I sure wish it was times I would have done anything to be able to speak and un understand Hungarian. Mm. Yeah. 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 Mm, and uh, so maybe a last a closing question. You came from Hungary. It was not from Poland or Czech Republic or uh, countries with also great theater traditions. Was there something specifically Hungarian? Was there something you would say that was that really came? <laughs> the sound a little bit. Forget my question. Yeah, they hear the sound. Can, can we hear a bit of sound? Uh, Brad, can you put the sound up? Maybe that's the Hungarian part of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yossi hmm? Gottman, Gottman was, has, has studied music in Israel and, and uh, he had all these Hungarian composers as masters. So they brought the Kodai bar to folk. Treasure, treasury. So the, the transcript that he did from James Brown uh, was drawing on that. So, uh, uh, one critic called it the Hungarian war song. Hungarian war song. But we do have from Eastern Europe the uh, cultural background. Cultural background, yeah. yeah. say there was a certain intellectualism to the work that the squat did and and a recognition of the importance of classical culture and bridging that with popular culture in a way that I think really did reflect the Hungarian background that yeah. I don't think comes through in a lot of other work. I think so. When I joined the theater in 72 in Budapest, um, um, 
I found the culture around the theater very particular, and I was really waiting to get there myself, to get initiated and to get to find out what makes these guys move. And actually, there, there, it was coming from Stefan Balint's circle, pretty much where that that the generations. Um, of tradition, intellectual tradition of, of uh, painters, philosophers, and uh, other thinkers. And it really had a peculiar, peculiar flavor. And their children and so forth. So that was part of the audience in Budapest. Yeah, um, maybe a li little bit less of the sound, and this is Jakob, who runs the Pen World Voices Literary Festival as a Hungarian. And I'm Hungarian, I was living in Hungary. You're yeah, living in Hungary. Yeah. You're doing uh, theater here, and I barely knew about you guys until I was in my mid-20s. Mid but what was really important was the ramification of, the, of, a, of an immigrant theater who were doing some, some type of work, which we rarely knew or heard about it, obviously, that was still in the 80s. But how the, the ramification of the work that they did here in terms of uh, experimental theater and then mainstream theater in Hungary, that was amazing. That was really amazing. It was, it's in our DNA. And it's, when I'm seeing these images, I can totally relate to that. And that's interesting. That would be amazing to know, you guys know more about this, to see what were the, what were the really the outcome and what were the, the effect of you um, of the Scott Theater's job here in New York, I would love to hear and see the you know the consequences and how it triggered, and what it triggered in in contemporary theater. I don't see anything like this. It's uh, it's so refreshing, so riveting to see this, and I'm really glad that Esther and all of you guys mentioned the the artistry of it and the and the, how how subtle and sophisticated the work was it's it's really it's really a gem thank you do you see anything i mean do you i mean you guys really see the the trajectory and it would be really nice to to see the you know the <laughs> scope of it um yeah i uh, thanks for saying that and and tying it in with your question about was was does it is there anything particular in the Hungarian culture sensibility. I'm not sure because I was very young when I left, but uh, I've just been going through my grandfather's archives, um, a lot of letters, and and as Eva mentioned, he was from a long line of intellectuals and a circle of artists. And also I remember Galusha's father, Peter, who's one of the main founders of the theater, who was like um, such a huge, funny, theatrical clown presence to me when I was a kid. So what I would say is reading all those letters, thinking about my father, about Galusha's father, is the sense of humor is maybe very Hungarian, I, I think. It's a very particular thing. It's not just mm -hmm. serious and intellectual, but there is also a very sharp sense of humor, I would very say. Very yep. dark at times, but, yep. but loving life. So we may be a uh, last question over here. Here, maybe take the microphone uh, here. No, this. Oh. I should begin by saying I, I know nothing about experimental theater. I went online and I found out uh, Jonathan Demi liked that thing with the Jeep and I didn't know it was uh, somebody in the audience and that really shook him up and everything too. I guess I was struck by um, a, present, uh, a line that says, you question the very act of a spectatorship. So does that mean you only had to please yourself Maybe the, most of the people who showed up were artists or friends or people in the community, that I'm a normal person, a retired teacher. If I showed up and I seemed bored and I was going on, you know, going on my phone and showing, you know, you wouldn't react to that because audience feedback didn't mean much to you at all. You were just trying to please yourself. Am I no. wrong? No. No. Oh. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you alter the performance to suit the fact that people weren't enjoying it or showing as much excitement as they might. So you, did you react uh, to the audience? Did the, the audience reaction influence Well, I think the audience always affects a room's mood. And 
but uh, it's a fine line between having integrity to your art and knowing how it's and sensing and feeling how it's received and that's really not that different from doing any work of art and you're not catering to please everyone because you got that right <laughs> but uh I think that you certainly pick up the energy in, in the room. Yeah, and uh, in all the videos I saw, nobody ever left uh, and crossed that uh, invisible line, so, which is quite, the people who did, which is fine. But I think uh, this was already a, a long evening, and I, uh, I think there is, the, interesting, there is a tradition, of course, of a Wooster, just one minute, there is a tradition of the Wooster group. I, um, let me just finish with that. There is a tradition of a Wooster group. There are many other, Richard Shackner's, John Jesseron's work, um, temporary distortion. I mean, there is a bloodline that flows through, but I think the U Squad Theater in itself was an incredibly unique uh, uh, pearl that shaped, you know, in these, uh, out of the sand corn and out, the, out of the disturbance. And uh, I really wish, uh, one of them, I, I would have seen these performances. I didn't, so um, I think we get an idea for an idea tonight. And I would like to thank you all for coming and coming together and looking back in the past. I know it's also not easy and it's also very emotional, but I want, I want to see, thank you all for coming and showing up. Jay also for being here and Bonnie and everybody. So um, if you have additional questions uh, you might have, you can ask them directly. We're going to have a reception in the room right away. And I think we, we're going to start, start stopping. Thank you. <laughs>